I suffered with a speech impediment growing up from the age of four until now. Not being able to use your own voice, I had to use something else. So to this day, drums hide me away from public speaking. Drumming can be very good for de-stressing, uh -huh. relaxation, drum therapy. So what would you say to people who are going through the process right now, where they have a dream on the heart, and they have a purpose and a passion for whatever this new thing is, what would you say to those people? Never listen to what others are saying. Don't let it register with you. If you're not obsessed with it, it's what you do and what you want to do, it's time to move on. You no. have to be completely and utterly obsessed. You be consistent with what you're doing. If you're not obsessed with Barbara or love it enough, it's not the right thing. Find something else. Keep going until exactly. you find something that you obsess over. Connor, welcome to the program, buddy. Welcome to the podcast. Uh, Thanks, Connor buddy. Muir, it's uh, very good to have you on. Connor is from Wexford. He's an absolute master at drumming and performing at weddings, festivals, and corporate events. His brand name is Con Muir. Con Moore, help me pronounce it. Con Moore, yeah. Con Moore, yeah, that's, that's all right. Nine out of ten. Nine out of ten, there we go. Conmore. So Connor, it's a privilege to have you on here. I can't wait to kick into it. Um, but we're gonna start pretty much from the bottom, from yeah. day one. What was like like for you growing up? What part of Ireland did you grow up in? And yeah, we'll crack on from there. Yeah, so I grew up in Gorey, County Wexford. Um I am uh I will be known to be a very, very proud Wexford man. And um I started my uh my early years as a musician and as a businessman from the age of 13. So I was uh, growing up in a very urban, urban filled town in the southeast of Ireland and uh, lots of sport and music and things like that. But I played sport for years and just knocked it on the head from a very young age because I knew that music was going to be my future and everything that that I did. So I started performing and teaching when I was 13 and I've never looked back. I've never had a boss. I've never had to try and get holidays off anyone else. It's always just been me. And I've been doing that since first year in school. And the only reason was it kind of clicked with with me earlier about the value of money. And yeah. the value of my own time. The value of seeing my friends. The value of taking the time to start a family. And that clicked with me really early on. And I kind of thought, if I can do that myself, therefore, I'll never be stressed, which I was totally wrong. Um, <laughs> yes. I'll never feel, but I'll never have pressure or stress put on me by anybody else but mm -hmm. myself. And I would much prefer that, you know, whereas, as I always say, I'm in control of me and my career, my holidays, my plans my shows, my creations. Mm -hmm. And that that clicked so, so early in play. And being honest, I used to like go down to like this DVD shop and I used to be mad for DVDs and, and everything. That I kind of thought, if I can work, I can buy as many DVDs as I like. And I did that. Uh -huh. Yeah. Adam Sandler ones and Jim Carrey's and stuff. And I was like, this is class. Like, well, Happy Gilmore. Happy oh, Gilmore. Ice Ventura. All, all of that, and I think I collected about 200 DVDs, all from my own pocket from the age of 13, 14, 15. I, used to, I, used to, I, I started lessons from a box room in my parents' house that no one was really happy about. I wasn't happy with the space. They weren't happy with the noise in an estate <laughs> in, the middle, in, in the middle of Gory, trying to make a few pounds. And I was out the door, like I was, I was about, sometimes I was 15 students a day. I wouldn't even chance that now, you know. What do you mean? Before, yeah, you were teaching. I was teaching 15 one-to-ones a day. So wow. That was, so wow. that was 15 half-hour slots. I was, what's that? That's seven and a half hours. And I Fuck do that stra me. straight through. People right. you say, what about lunch? What about sleep? What about this? What about that? Yeah, a million percent. I I hear you on that. If people knew and seen, you know, what goes on behind the scenes to be like, what? You're fucking crazy. But um, 
I want to bring it right back because uh, I'm beaming from air to air listening to that story, listening to not just the story, but the reason you just, you, everything about it. Uh, the reason you started in your own business, the reason you wanted to own your own time, own your own life, and not need to ask for permission of mm -hmm. others. Um, it took me many years before I got to that stage. Well, I realised the younger, but to be able to get to a stage where I could let go and not depend on a job and things like that. But yeah. um, well done, man. That's incredible. And as we all know, life doesn't start at 13. So before the age of 13, um, how was life like for you growing up in Wexford? What was school like for you? You know, what was the family like? Um, and a few of those things before we carry on. Um, like, uh, school was like I went to a real towny school, as you can probably tell from like my accent. I'm a I'm a huge I'm a huge towny. Like I live out in the country and have done for the past seven or eight years. I'm out of place here, so I'm a real gory town lad. <laughs> I uh, I love I love the guy club I played for Nevena growing up. I played for Gory Celtic in soccer. Um trying to keep it away from music, but I played for like the local branches and things like that. And in school, school was never for me. Um I wasn't a tear away, I wasn't bold. Um I was just school didn't click with me so young that I even took a year out in play school. That's how much I didn't like wow. being, being controlled. Now, I'm not saying that school's controlling, but that's how I felt. I went to school the first year. My mother used to have used to have to have a battle with a three-year-old child that was attached to her leg. Oh, stop it. And then the second year, she said, there's no point. And I was like, I'm just not going. And right up until maybe my leaving start, I thought, I've gotten into college now. I went, like, I went and did a course where I only got in on uh, audition basis and points weren't really a thing because it was the first trial year of, of this course. So I thought, what's the point in having one? It took about 10 lads to sit me down and say, if you have a degree and the mood strikes in maybe 10 years time and you want to go back and do like a Hibernia course or, or like another BA or go teaching and get your three months of holidays, blah, 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 you can but you have to sit your exams, da, da, da. So from the whole way up, I always knew that I wasn't in control. But when I went in the first year in school, it gave me that independence. But as a child growing up, before I became a businessman of sorts, um, I was active, I was very social. I used, to, I used to visit a lot of people. And that's something I've always took with me. like. Like mm -hmm. when people look at my life from like the outside, and I'm not saying that my life is the be all and end all of my life, but whenever people do look in and see that I'm traveling to a lot of places, that I'm running three or four businesses at once, they kind of say, Jesus, have you got the time to do anything at all? But but yet I'm the one who's ringing all of the lads to catch up, to stay in touch, uh -huh. dropping in, you know, like that's really, really important. Whereas if I didn't do that, it's not worth it. Yeah, it's not. It doesn't make sense to me. Like, if I can't make time for my family or even the lads from college, or can't even set a date to go meet the lads from college, three months out, there's something wrong. Mm -hmm. There's something really, really wrong. Like, I like doing well, but I like taking my own time. And being honest, Dara, I don't think I, I've actually found that balance yet. Like, I am only thirty-two. Have I found that balance? I don't know. Will we ever find that balance? Who knows? We may never find it, but we'll always try. Well, here's the thing. Uh, one of my mentors, Preston, my, my number one mentor, Preston, smiles. Uh, I'll give him a shout out here. Is there a such thing as balance? Because yeah, it's, no. a, it's, a, it's, a, it's something it's something that's sold by society that you need to balance everything in life. And I also challenge that. Instead of trying to balance everything, why not be with what you're doing at that moment in time and be with all of that? And when mm -hmm. it's time to, and this is what I do in business again, I'm similar to you. I've got um, a few businesses that I operate this podcast and then clients, and I've got a family as well. But in order to be able to manage all of those things, some of the plates go up in the air, 
and the other plates go down on the ground and you come back to it like, like this podcast is the exact reason um I put the podcast down for nearly two years while I done my masters in coaching and I started uh, another project with the construction of the villas here in Bali. I know my capacity and I don't want to burn out. Okay. But when you have them, you can pick them up and put them down. Once once they're flying by themselves, then uh, you get to choose what you put more time and effort into. Yeah. And you know what? I actually love falling. I love whenever the plates fall. I love it. Because I'll never mm-hmm. do it again. You know? Like... I thought I thought talking to Connor who who you had on a couple of weeks ago and Connor's been brilliant. Connor's like Connor's been like my my mentor. So if anyone who is listening, Connor who also goes as Daddy Sax, like he's like we often have our chats about you know the value and things like that and the balance thing. But I don't like and I think we've spoken about it before. It's not about the balance in it. It's about how well you cope with the situation. Uh-huh. I think, and I think that I think that's more so the question than than anything. How well can you cope with the situation? Other than have you got a balance? Because we don't. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we definitely don't. Because because if balance is client number one wants you to give you this amount of time for that fee, and then client number two, and then a family, and then your business admin needs this all of those four things are going to ask too much of you so therefore balance is off the table it's about uh-huh. how well you can cope time management things like that but yeah balance is a it's a good question because yeah. no one knows how to answer it, just like my answer there but it's about the coping side of it and sometimes uh-huh. you might get sometimes you might run run yourself absolutely ragged um you know, and then go, oh, now I need to go back to square one. And then you go complete extreme and go two hours a day of work for one week. You're like, right, okay. And then two hours a day turns into half a day of being on the phone to a client and going, let's go pick up the kids. I didn't do the shopping, didn't take out the bins. You know what I mean? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, that's the thing. Uh, coping is another word for our nervous system. Um, it's what your nervous system can basically cope with as you're doing all of the things. Yes, when there's a lot of them, you obviously can't do them all together. But a lot of people get overwhelmed by that because they try to do them all together. Um, and the more comfortable you get with picking things up and putting them down, because you can't do all of the things all of the time, the easier it will be to manage five businesses, 10 businesses, X amount of clients, family, and all the other things, social gatherings that come in between. But coming back to you and your story, um, so school was a bit of a burden to you growing up, and it took for 10 people to sit you down before you understood the importance of having a couple of those um, qualifications, should you ever wish to fall back, should your music career fail. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. Always... Uh always came back to the hole you can't really expect drums to get you out of a hole <laughs> well it helped me getting a house so yeah yeah well, look at, now but that the, we're on that go ahead you go first sorry but like that's i think that coming from the burden it actually turned into like one of my biggest motives was lads going can you really make a living doing what you're doing and that used to kind of insult me. Uh-huh. Now I know that I know that people weren't going down that route, but people say things and people feel things in different ways. They can approach them in different ways that can be quite insulting. But that used to really insult me. But yet it used to put a rocket up my arse and be like, watch this. Watch mm. me. I can guarantee you I can be one of Ireland's leading drum workshop and working drummer on the scene in five years. Give me five years. I'm the only one out there now that's doing festivals, weddings, corporates, drumming workshops, educations, courses, mm. providing providing technique skills, true English, true Irish, fluent in Irish. Well, no way. Epic. Work in Irish. Yeah, so Even I work with a me. band. Uh, you're all right, hard. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
like you're probably thinking with school and all, I obviously learned it back in school. I learned it as much as you did. But whenever yeah. I left school, but we'll probably come on to that. So I was way abandoned. But now I I do those workshops in Irish and English and Grail Skulls, Shocks in the Grail again, Wellness Weeks, because of drumming can be uh, very good for de-stressing, uh, uh-huh. relaxation, drum therapy, things like that. And the reason, if you want to go back to then, is the reason why I always had that that passion for the drum therapy stuff was that I suffered with a speech impediment growing up from the age of four until I was, until now, basically, uh-huh. you know? So, and I think becoming a businessman at 13 gave me validation that I was worth it at the uh-huh. time. Um, not being able to use your own voice, I had to use something else. So to this day, drums hide me away from public speaking. Yeah, the only way it is that I can express myself, but I can speak no problem on a stage if a drum is in front of me because I know what I'm talking about. I'm talking okay. about what I'm doing up here. And hello, ladies and gentlemen, you're very welcome to the new seminar with Connor Moore. I've been a professional drummer for blah 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 blah. No problem. Put me up on stage, talk about anything else, crumble, total crumble. That's and really you're probably interesting. Thinking, you're probably thinking you can't hear the speech impediment, put a lot of work into it from a very early age. I thank my mom and dad to actually detect that and put it in. I see it too often now in schools where parents ah. are like, oh, I don't think it's a speech impediment. Oh, it'll be fine. Yeah. Oh, yeah. he'll grow out of it. You don't. Okay. Um, that's an incredible part of the story. But I want to come back to something that you said there a few minutes ago. Um, because it's in my opinion that Friends and family are the biggest killers of dreams on the planet. You see it everywhere, you know, oh, you can't do that. You won't make a living out of that. You won't get to travel the world with X dream that little Johnny has or, or little Connor has or little Dara had back in the day. Um, what were some of the things that family and friends said to you um, when, you, when you decided that you were going to pursue a career in music? Um. I'll start from your last statement there. They never knew that I that I was going to pursue a career in music. We're still in the pre-real career era. Okay. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's so, more like, oh, so he'll do a bit of drumming and then and then he'll, find a real job. At 32. <laughs> at 32, I think it's too late. I, like, you know, yeah. I'm starting, like, I, I've been looking into private pensions there now. <laughs> like, you know, so we're kind of done with all that but even with um my immediate family were very were very kind of like i think they were under under the impression that connor will do whatever he wants to do anyway and you know what connor will be fine they knew that i was always going to be an entrepreneur of some sort yeah and they didn't really care for what what it was not in a like oh like they didn't care they didn't worry they, they weren't concerned they weren't concerned as in, God, I hope he does well at this and I don't think he's going to do well. They knew that I they knew that I got up every Monday morning with the fear, as everyone still does. We don't know what bill is going to come in. We don't know what, what sort of rates are going to fluctuate. We don't know what's going to actually happen. But the fear gets me going. I ah. do. I, I, I have a massive fear. I have a massive fear of failing. It's massive, but I don't think if... I don't think if you don't have it, you're Connor, not going to do much. So you have, you said uh, you have you have a massive fear of failing. Massive fear. It's the only thing that that actually gets me going. Mm-hmm. That's it. It's the fear is the complete fear of failing. Like, okay, I'm going to come back to that. And thank you very much for your vulnerability and being honest. Um, I will come back to that. But for now, um, I'll just pick apart the. People telling telling you that you can't do something. Um, what would you say to not just not your younger self, but people who are younger than you, or or whatever age they are right now? Actually, because there's a lot of people that change career later in life or at any, at any stage in life. So, what would you say to people who are going through the process right now, and their friends and family are telling them they're mad, don't do that, where they have a dream on the heart. 
and they have a purpose and a passion for whatever this new thing is, but everybody is talking them out of doing it. What would you say to those people? What I'd say to them is, uh, is to never, is to never listen to what others are saying. Don't listen. Definitely don't let it register with you. Uh, no days off for the first couple of months. Absolutely no days off. Make sure that your interest and passion about what you're doing, selling, retailing, anything is obsessive, really. If you're not obsessed with what you do and what you want to do, it's time to move on. You mm -hmm. have to be completely and utterly obsessed, but not in a social manner. You've got to wake up going, I love this. Ah. I love this because if you don't love oh. it, you might you might as well go off and get yourself your nine to fiver if you want. But if you want a 10 to two -er, <laughs> admin, run down, like run down the town, grab a coffee, get a meeting, bring one of the boys, work, 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 get your gig on your Friday, your two gigs on Saturday, get your festival, get your graphics done. Your new video is up and coming. Book Andrew Heaney, Andrew to come down, does a video do like your festival, have something happening in the background at all times. And ah. yeah. So just stay, yeah, yeah. So basically be consistent with what you're doing. And um, if you're not obsessed with what or love it enough, it's not the right thing. Find something else. Keep going until exactly. you find something that you obsess over. I love that. I love that. So um, you left school uh, when you... You left school when you were 13, did you, after your junior said, or did you do your leaving? I did the leaving, yeah. I left school when I was 19, because At I had nine. to, I, uh, I should have been 18, but someone took a year out and played school. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And um, from then, tell us about getting kicked off into your career, or into music. So, before I left school, um, my career had kind of started when when I was in school. I was with... Um, I was with a drumming group in Wexford Town called Extreme Rhythm and a um, bunch of Wexford Town heads and still good friends of mine. And uh, we did we did probably some of the coolest gigs we've ever done. One of them, anyway, like we did X Factor. We gigged with Kelly Clarkson twice. We did Wembley Arena. We did, we did the Tree Arena. We did our own shows in the Wexford Opera House. We did our own show in the Olympia Theatre. We were all ripped to shreds, body paint, fake tan, manic tribal drumming. Uh, Badly. Promoted by, by MCD. And at this time, we'd done Celtic Woman, songs from the park. We were on that DVD in Powers Court Gardens where the set was like worth a million. We we're up on the top. I never forget that. I remember getting food poisoning on, like, on set. And even during the recording there was a camera going by and we're all like giving it loads and all for like the big opening song and as the camera went by i am attending to my food poisoning and then back on set again back yeah, camera shot. so <laughs> yeah so you can actually you can actually see the whole thing but whenever the camera goes over there I'm off doing that. And then the camera comes back and then I'm back into character, you know? Ah, oh, Jesus. Yeah. So that's, that, that actual gig was like my first ever, oh shit, sort of a moment. This is massive. This is shit. This is cameras. I'm 17. I'm a professional drummer. I'm deemed as a professional player alongside these legends on, on, on stage who are making money, traveling the world, playing music. I'm deemed as the same as them. I'm not deemed as a child. This isn't the charity act. This is a, this is show night. This is no messing. This is like, if you're not up to the mark, off you go, you know? So I was with that group then for uh, five, five or six years. And we did all the Kelly Clarks and stuff and X Factor and got to meet cool people. And in Louis Walsh's dressing room with Derma O'Leary, Gary Barlow, uh, mm -hmm. Sharon Core, who I called Andrea, and I'll, I'll never live it down. Um, is that are they, is that one of the sisters? One of the sisters, yeah. So I called her by the wrong name, basically. Ah, so look, it's not like you know, it's the same family. So you got to know it. <laughs> you know, 
a couple of champagnes, you know what I'm like. Um, and then uh, moved on then to um, probably the brightest part of my career as regards friends, family, and doing really cool gigs was Shaolin. Shaolin was formed from um, Colossal Lurgan, which was the Irish speaking college here in Galway. And like I said, I had no wire. And I literally landed to do a job to record drums. And I was asked, do you have any Irish? And I said, no. So don't bother speaking Irish to me. <laughs> I'm here uh -huh. to do a job. So I went up for two days and I was back the following week. And I was back up there for three weeks. And I was one of the co-creators with the lads, with Shalane. And we all created um, Avicii versus Lurgan which was the Wake Me Up in, in in Irish track that got a million hits in a week. And after that, Dara, it's been, that's probably the biggest kickstart of my career. That's when I started hitting, hitting the road. Yeah, probably. yeah. What, what age were you then? What age was I then? I want to say 21. 21. I think I was. Yeah. Incredible. Send me the link to that. I'd like to have a listen. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. How is that? How is that all going now? Well, how is the track going? Is that band still together? That band is still going, and that band is still one of my most favorite bands in Ireland, and mm -hmm. still probably they're probably my most favorite people I've ever worked with. They're mm -hmm. like, like it was there was seven of us, and then it turned into six, and people just kind of move on. So. There was six of us and one girl at first. Um, and then there was just the six lads and Jenny moved on. I think Jenny moved to Bali. She went on to greater and better things in Bali. And she, yeah, she's living a really cool life there, like yourself. And then... Um, Give me the lads, details. Yeah, so Jenny um, Jenny Russell is a singer, uh, just all around talented, brilliant songwriter. Um she's that girl that me and my wife would often talk about and say if she ever recorded her own album I, I would be first to buy it and it's such a privilege to actually work with people you're a fan of and that's that and that's how I see Shalane I'm such a fan of them and then I'm playing with them it's such an yeah, amazing that's feeling a, that's incredible you know and it's not it's not that you're just such a big fan of the music that they write it's it's just them as a part, like it's their values and huh. how they treat their friends and their family and the way they, they look up to their parents and stuff and and all that stuff. And I have to say, it was definitely the happiest years of my life musically. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not saying I, I don't have them anymore, but it's times where you you look back and go, I was a young lad then and by God, we had some crack. Like we yeah, did the yeah. Euros, we did the Euros 2016 anthem the irish roar and we got flown over to go watch ireland sweden and then we landed in, we landed in paris to do one gig we were there for five days you can only imagine the crack ah you're getting, man you're killing me <laughs> getting paid to go see ireland play v sweden right like, and do you what know, you love just do what you love and going around paris just going around going around with the fai and meeting a few um Charity groups from Ireland and stuff, and going out with the fans. And is that when Al John was fucking throwing tickets all over the shop? Is it? No, it wasn't that year. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can tell you, John. What's his name again? John what? John Delaney. John Delaney. That's it. Yeah. We you had know, a handcuffs. We, we had a few sing songs with John. Now I have to say, other than that, I can't say much more. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, look, I heard he's a bit of crack anyway, Sam. I heard he's a bit Lo of crack, but... Loves the sing song. Loves, loves the sing song. Like, well, leave him to it. Leave him to yeah. it, whatever he is. But that sounds epic, man. Um, incredible life memories. Do you still connect with that Shaolin group? Do you still play yeah. with them at all? Um, I play with them the very, very odd time. Um, The very odd time. Like, if they... If they wanted me to come up on stage for a tune because it's what we recorded back in the day, absolutely. Um, I don't like the odd project with them, but it all it all comes down to time. Mm -hmm. It all comes down to 
family like I know every year like they'll always offer me like like you're talking about me killing you but this kills me and and I wouldn't change it but I just can't leave my wife and child for that long whereas the lads are like but sure bring them with you and I'm like yeah but more has a job they'll always offer me two weeks in 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 the states expenses paid right and it's like Irish festivals and oh, the Mil- crazy Iowa Milwaukee and then and then to add to all of that they get like a residency in like these bars and venues in Australia for like three weeks and they live out of this apartment beside a lake or the sea or wherever they are I go I just can't the, the complete just, opposite of the venues they play in <laughs> I know the complete but look at this is this is the life now that I have that that I've always dreamed of. You know, I have a wife who I love and adore and who supports me and has never said that's stupid to any idea I may have had, even if it was stupid. I have a daughter and I have a house and I live in Gory and I'm off more or less Monday to Friday a lot of the time. It's amazing. But, you know, you could also be a, an incredible inspiration that you already are to many, I'm sure, many of your students, but for your daughter. Um, Travelling the world with your, with your love and your passion and your purpose work. Um, I have two kids, a wife, and I'm off to Australia. I was in Austin, Texas there in May. I go to Australia now in three weeks' time. We'll be over there for a couple of weeks. And then I go back to Austin, Texas again, all, all, all for work. So, and this is, Deadly. this is this year, this is this year, like this is without the rest of the years of our lives. And that's one thing I want to do, get to a stage where I can bring the family with me. Um, if it's an opportunity for you to do that, to some of these memories, like, like your own, going to Paris with, uh, yeah. with Sharon and, and playing in front of the Irish fans and, all the rest of those things, you know, there's some of those memories that you can never, uh, they become core memories for the family. So when there is an opportunity there, ask Maura, I think you said her name is? Yeah, Maura, yeah. To ask for time off. <laughs> We're going to the States. Let's go, baby. Yeah. <laughs> like, I've often said it going, if, if, if we can get Sophie or our kids, yeah. who knows, to, to that age where they're happy to go. I mm-hmm. will I will be back on to like the lads going, book me in for 2028 or book me in there for 2029. Yeah, just book does, it. Does your daughter not like flying? <laughs> I'm just not a fan of bringing her at three years of age. I just okay. see the stress of it. And do you know what? She would probably she would probably love it. And she probably would love it because her mammy is cabin crew for Aer Lingus. So. Oh, is she? Oh, Jesus, yeah. Yeah. So. So, she, so she absolutely loves the fact that daddy is a drummer and mammy flies a plane. We she have flies a plane. We have a she captain. She flies a plane. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're living with a pilot, yeah. yeah. Yeah, love it, love it. Yeah, well, look at what I found. Obviously, I travel around the world with my kids and I've just been at home in Ireland there for four weeks. Uh, to fly in and out, of, uh, fly in and out of Ireland from B- Bali, it's twenty nice. hours altogether. Travel time, but they oh, love God. it. They love it. They they love it. They get to eat the snacks. They get loud. Literally, they get presents from the start of the trip to the end of the trip, both on the plane and in Ireland, and then coming back on the plane yeah. again. Uh, they have all the movies, the games, you know, on the back of the consoles. Um. They look like they've been more malleable to traveling than me when I was an adult. When I start traveling, they just they just like a duck to water. It's another thing for them. Um, but carrying too much stuff can get a bit hectic. But but it's not hectic for them. It's just carrying the stuff for me. It's I just seriously. life. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. It's just life. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. So she'll grow into it. Put it that way. Um. But she'll be forever and eternally grateful, I'm sure, for getting oh, yeah. to see the world at that age. Um, 
we're coming back to you and your story. So that was probably what around your mid twenties when you uh, started doing that. Yeah, so I started probably when I was twenty two, and then left. Then at about twenty, I think I was twenty six. Twenty. I left in twenty sixteen. What's that? That's eight years ago. Twenty four. So was, yeah, I was with them from the age of twenty. Sorry, nineteen to twenty because I started in Lurgan at nineteen and I left at twenty four. So five years, yeah. Five years. And then since then you've been out by yourself, you're just doing your own thing. Yeah. So I resigned from Shulin with a lot of tears um on the thirty first of August twenty sixteen and Sound Out Rhythm Entertainment and Education launched on the first of September twenty sixteen. I was unemployed for about three hours. <laughs> <laughs> love it, love it. And how has that been for you? Um, I want to come back to something as well. But how how has it been for you? Good. It's been great. I have, I have a brand name. I have a brand with schools. I've got a brand for lessons. You know, it's nice to have a brand. It's tidy. You know, it feels good. It's something that I'll always need. And the company is Sound Out Rhythm. Sound Out being someone who is Sound Out, you know. Um, yeah. Sound Out Rhythm has been going since 2016. And, yeah, I do schools. Like, I I, I, I operate workshops in schools where it's um, Bowron's percussion, um, Bowron's percussion and drums. And, basically, the genres of music is called From Trad to Techno. So Okay. You get the cultural stuff in, and then you get the stuff that they love. So you go from yeah, oh, doing... is it? the techno. Uh, yeah. all, all the country folk love the techno, aren't they? Oh, they don't love use, it. Don't use. And um, they uh... the the big flirty jeans and the fucking techno music. <laughs> <laughs> all, all the luminous. A bit of a bit of Declan Nerney and topped off with a bit of techno, but yeah. But I think that's the selling point with the TYs because then they kind of roll their eyes. What's a home. TY? So TY is um, a transition year. Okay. So transition year over here. So like you get onto your TY year ahead in all schools across Ireland. So my yeah. marketing game across that would be fairly, it's fairly strong. So I've got like 600 emails so, that I kind of just check into. So, so you're selling them what they want and you're giving them what they need. So you're, you're yeah, selling yeah. you're selling them uh, techno, and you're giving them the country con the cultural country music as well, because yeah, uh, coming back to the era of speaking, I I've lived abroad for fucking close to eighteen years now, yeah. and it's, it's the one biggest thing that I wish I had, is uh, Irish um, language, and I'd love my kids to have it too. Um, I will get back and I will I will study it, but it's something that I always feel. As an Irish man, that I should have, I should be able to speak it, because obviously overseas, yeah, uh, you meet Lebanese people, Italian people, you know, national. Even here in Bali, they speak Bahasa. My kids are learning Bahasa, so they know more Indonesian than they know that than they do Irish. But you know, hearing people speaking a native native tongue, and other kids that have three, four, five different languages, and they're only kids, brings me like. You know, it makes me wish that I had ours. I know. But, like, we all, like, we all do. But not every country had the, uh, by God, we will not get into this, but not every country had the... <laughs> the Brits fucking trying to yeah. clear our trouts every five minutes. Exactly. Not every country had that and said, you can't speak your language. We're going to we're gonna take those six counties and the rest was, was and is history. Yeah, history. Like, so, history, so, yeah. So we can't, present. we can't really say, I feel bad for. Her. Of course we don't. It's just not in our blood. It was taken mm-hmm. from us, you know. So, for me to be able to speak it, yeah, it's cool, it's fine. I'm not, I'm not always practicing it. I had a, a workshop two weeks ago in Kildare with Kildara Lagrelga, and I met a practice like, and they pick up the phone and they're like, should they Efa us Kildara Lagrelga on Wiltusa talked, and I'm like. <laughs> English, English, go away, English, English, get my head and go into Irish and hard, like it is really yeah. hard. But, but even for someone who speaks it well enough to get themselves by in a class and with his mates, 
like it's still the it's it's still hard to switch it back on like mm-hmm. like for me for me to even say that little bit of speaking there was a bit you're kind of moving things around because you're we speak english that's that's just the way that it is you know is it dying i don't know i'd be afraid to, to say whether it is um but i think things but like, over over the west coast it's it's very strong isn't it it's it's, it's strong in parts like in like, parts yeah around like galway you, and uh, clare and connemara so yeah so you get like spiddle ross muck ross Neville, uh, all all those areas out in Connemara and then there's a little bit of Donegal, Guidor, then there's some in West Kerry, some in Dungarvan, mm-hmm. and there's some in Mead. I can't think of the area in Mead, but yeah. Like it's still there, but like you're not talking areas, you're talking about houses. Oh, you're, talking houses. you're not really saying like unless you're in Galway, like you go into the supermarket there. Like this is mad. You go into a supermarket and I was Mary, in Galway fucking two weeks ago. Up in Connemara? Um no, I was in Salt Hill. You weren't far then. You wouldn't yeah. be far from Connemara. It's literally that road and straight out. And you could have Mary giving out about whoever won the lotto in another petrol station. All in okay. Irish. Like Love this it. is normal Love life. It. Like this isn't put on for you because you're in an area to learn out. This is real life. Yeah. That's mad. So it's kind of like we're thinking back to like us reading these books for 14 years and all we're thinking is I'm never going to use that. I'm yeah. never going to. As a, as a gonna, young know-it-all. Yeah. 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 A young know-it-all. And then these people depend on it like. Aha. Uh-huh. There's, there's actually a, a young girl I introduced to my mom and dad. She was the daughter of the principal and she was only eight years of age. And I says to Darren, I says, Darren, should they or should they my and she's like, oh, that's Bula Lieb, which is like, nice to meet you. This is my parents. Nice to meet you. And I says to my parents, this is Darren, who's a TG Cahar, child star. She's brilliant, great Irish, blah, blah, blah. But they responded back to her in English. And she looks back up towards me going, she didn't, she didn't even understand English. Okay. Really. Because now she obviously she understood some words of it, but she's in an Irish school learning Irish through Irish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love it. I love it. Just pure, pure untouched. I love it. Um, that's incredible. Yeah, that's just my opinion on it. And for me, that's something that I'd love to have. Um, but carrying on with you and your story, what would you say, you know, I was going to say, what would you say the biggest highlight of your life has been so far? But well, well, yeah, go for that. Uh, biggest highlight professionally? Yeah. For me personally, I think it was 12 pubs of drums that I did. Mm-hmm. It was it was definitely the most organic thing, the most riskiest thing, the most, this could be really, really shit or this could be good. So basically 12 pubs of drums was a viral video that went out and I did a, a different rhythm in each pub using something that was a part of the pub, no drums. Okay. So, so the layers of rhythms all amounted up to a piano cover of the little drummer boy and it and it showcases Gory in the most beautiful way. So it, it was shot uh professionally on camera and recorded on site as I went around 12 pubs. So I started at 10 o'clock on a Tuesday morning and I finished shooting the video at six o'clock that evening. And yeah, it was one of those oh. ideas where No, you go. It was one of the, one of those ideas what? Like it was one of those ideas that just could have fell flat on its face. Aha. Uh-huh. Or it was an idea that was going to do okay. Okay. And when I did it to this day, I think it's a, I think it's close enough to maybe 2 million hits. It gets shared every year. People from New Zealand. So that's at around the Christmas time, is it? Yeah. So people, so people who lived abroad, like people in Australia were, were like, 
you're on our screens here in a pub. Mm. People from Spain are, are taking pictures of my face playing in a pub and going, you're going, someone is live streaming this now, telling us we have to watch it if you're from Ireland. People were crying, saying, I miss home so much. Oh my God, I've got goosebumps here. Chills. And that, and that, and that was never the intent behind it. The intent was to give it a go. If it's shit, we won't put it out there. If it's good, <laughs> put it out there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll drop it like a top. But come here. I just want to come back and help me understand. So the 12 pubs playing a different, well, playing drums with a different object in each of the pubs. So that was the 12 pubs combined was the whole song. Is that right? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So you put all the so, different sounds together and, and that was the end product. That was a full song then. Exactly. So like, for instance, I start on a very dusty bar stool, right? In like the bridge bar. That's like the first rhythm. So I start in the complex, which is the local pub and bing, I get the idea. And then we go down to do the bridge bar. We get, we grab the dusty bar stool and we start the first rhythm. And bum, ba -dum, bum. That's it. Boom, ba -dum, bum. And then we have to build on top of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Up. I get you now. And then up to the next pub. That rhythm is now going is now going through my ear. It's da 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 da. Next rhythm, ba ba da da. Give them what they want. Boom, ba da 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 da. And then you're straight into it. And people are like, okay, I need to see what comes next. So ah, there's a dart. I love it. So there's a dartboard in it. There's a pool smash. So like you. Break the yeah, balls, yeah. And boom, and then and then the that gets a bit of a boom straight into your dart drop. The hatch door that's at the end of a bar, you know those. <laughs> yeah, yes, yeah. I love it. Banging that. The the best part of that, and it's absolutely genius, and you'll never be able to recreate this. Was that we went to my 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 local pub. For governance and we asked them for a pint for a pint of guinness not to drink it but to smash it right to get to actually get that sound so the rhythm was something like one two three four smash okay unfortunately mm -hmm. you can see back on the video now we did that in one take because the price of pints did, <laughs> these days right it didn't go smash it went one, two, three, four, bounce, smash. It bounced. Okay. So the so the sound engineer took that back in, and he says, "I didn't even have to speed that up or, or actually or actually slow it down. The glass, when it bounced and smashed, was bang on time." Okay. Wow. So then we uh, we listened back to the smash, and the smash wasn't really blowing our socks off. We we're like, it was like a more of a bump. So one of the locals, one of the regulars in the pub goes, I'll be back in a minute. And his house is literally across the road and he comes back over and he hands me these plates and he says, I know it's not original, but you could trick the crowd with this one. And it was a prank. It was a prank joke set of smashing dishes. It was all these little metal plates. So we recorded that sound, used the visual of the pint. Oh, I love it. There you go. That's incredible. Yeah. Um, that's amazing. It's uh, I heard Dr. Dre on a podcast or an interview there a few months ago. And he was speaking about when he became a producer 30, 40 years ago, whenever it was, um, how they used to come up with the sounds. You just buy tapes, do exactly what you said, smash something, hit a spoon or something, you know, yeah. close a car door, yeah. and then multiply that sound. Like, it's really interesting to hear that you've done the exact same thing. Uh, because yeah. now, today, it's all electronic. There's all sounds yeah. in, in, I don't know the words for them, but <clears throat> keyboards. Nope. And... Yeah, like, and it's, and it's still something that I'm, I'm still a little bit, allergic to it because these electronic sounds and electronic pads that are going to give you what the sound of an of something that's raw and acoustic so literally the electronic is almost swallowing its words 
in many ways. Like you can see drummers there with drum kits and they yeah. have this pad because it makes it sound like acoustic drums. Just get acoustic drums. And I think yeah. learning on electronic drums for young people, it's not going to... It's like thinking you're able to ride a bike with stabilizers. Yeah, like yeah. And do you know what just dropped in for me there as, as you were speaking? It's a bit like AI. It is yeah. pretty much AI, isn't it? It's like AI has come and swallowed up the original. There's nothing natural. There's no gifts behind it. Like, you know, whereas yeah. I think a drummer will always be aware of his sounds uh -huh. around him. Like underneath, I'm very aware that my island here sounds like a kick drum, like an 8 uh -huh. inch kick drum. You know, like I'm... Yeah, yeah. I, I'm quite, yeah. And I'm very curious about how things sound and stuff. You know, like whenever I see like someone... This is how mad my head is. Like the missus was pouring out old, old water from like a vase and she kind of knocks it off like the stainless steel tap while doing it. And the water was going out and it kind of went, Ooh. and I was like, do that again. Of course, I'm over there for like 20 minutes, filling it back up and trying to, and trying to copy it and do it again for no reason. I'm not going <laughs> to do anything with it. I'm not going to record it. I'm not going to yeah. do anything, but I need to get my fix. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. A master of your craft. It's a, uh, it's, it's, it's a heart, really, isn't it? I'm the same. I, I used to be a plumber, um, still mm. love it. Like I literally, I can't go for the piss, no joke, without in every, every pipe in the bathroom. I, 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 I be sitting, standing there, sitting there, whatever, and uh, yeah, I'll be checking out the pipe work and be like, God, oh, I would have done it this way. I would have done it that way. <laughs> Amazing. How many cowboys? Ah, oh, cow cowboys all over the place. Me included. Me included. <laughs> but like, I swear to God, underground car parks, toilets, kitchens, my friends' houses. Like, it doesn't matter where I am. That's my brain is locked into that uh, yeah. mode. I love it. It was art for me. Um, even looking back, because cause you're bringing something to life that you created in your mind. Even though you get plans and drawings. Um, yeah. You still got to create that with your mind. You, you don't, it's not like an AI thing where you can spit out a, a ready made fucking plum set or whatever, you know. So I understand what you're talking about in terms of uh, following the sounds. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that was a big thing. Send me the link for that as well. I yeah, must absolutely. get the links for all these things so I can. Um, no worries. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Add them into the forward or the description of, of the podcast episode. Um, so yeah, now today, um, I noticed you do a lot of things around Ireland. Actually, I have a question. In terms of trad music, so the Irish language yeah. is obviously um debatable whether it's dying off or where it's at, but there's a big yeah. conversation that it is dying off. In terms of uh, folk and country and Irish music, um, where does that fare in those terms? In your trad music. Trad music, Irish music, yeah, uh, country music. Like, is Ireland in terms of music losing its culture, or are there still people like look at the Wolf Towns, for instance? They're seventy years together. I was blessed to get to see them at um, Electric Picnic this year. Yeah, but, uh, uh, is that type of musician a dying breed in Ireland? You know what? It's um. It's something that I'm really, I'm really looking into at the minute. Like I'm researching in schools, like the FLA is hitting massive numbers in young people uh -huh. playing music, competing, um, starting bands, Irish trad festivals across Scotland, the UK and Ireland, better than ever. Love but it. yet... But yet there's no one learning an instrument in school anymore. I think it's going to come. And I hate to say it because my roots are trad. Like Bowron mm -hmm. is my, Bowron is my first instrument. It's the, it's the one thing. Like I started when I was eight, started teaching that 13. I love it. It's literally, it's, it's, it's the only instrument I ever feel like it's a part to me. Maybe uh -huh. the bongos, but the, the Bowron is, if the house was, was on fire, Wife, child, Bowron. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. 
All, all in that order. No, the Baron first. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, yeah. But uh, like, um, and th- like I used to, like I started doing the workshops when I was sixteen, and I go into and I go into classrooms and ask them who here plays an instrument more than half the class, hand goes up, and then now, who here plays an instrument, one maybe at a push, I play a bit of guitar. That's it. Right. Co- COVID has done things to young people that we just don't know what it is yet. And it's scary. And that's just being realistic. That's nothing against the young people. That's yeah. it's it's not it's it's not their fault. We would all do the same as they're doing. But no I remember asking them a real open question because I was so confused as to why. And I remember asking them as, as a group, I was like, does nobody here want to be in a spotlight do well become famous anyone and then they they, they they all went nah and i was like what about sport and they're like oh that's different but i want to be a hurdler but there's no money in that so you can hardly be famous like this sort of attitude uh-huh. i don't know it's crazy so where is the irish culture going right now really strong musically really really yeah. strong Foster and Allen next year, 50 years. They're going to do a tour. They're going to sell it out like that. Mm-hmm. You've got the flat kill coming back down to Wexford here. Huge, uh, su- huge uh, success. Chills. I was at the yeah. flat in, uh, in Clare. Unbelievable. Ennis. Ennis, yeah, in Ennis, yeah. I met my wife a few years back and I learned how to surf as well uh, when I was Deadly. in Australia. So, on city center, fucking Dublin. Anything outside of Dublin was like another world. Although I went down to Kildare for a lot of uh, my childhood once a year, uh, Clongas Wood College. But there's parts of Ireland that I've only learned. Like it's still now driving across the Galway there when I was home. Like Ireland is such a beautiful country. So the flag, going to the flag for me was like completely alien. Didn't know what I was going into. Um, yeah. went there with my wife, uh, not wife at the time, but a lot of friends over there in Ennis. And we had the best time, like the yeah. absolute kids, five, six, seven years of age on the street, playing the bower on, playing the, the tin whistle and whatever yeah. other instrument, but everywhere. And playing it well. Playing it well. Yeah. Well. Pumping, like I couldn't believe it. It was yeah. fucking pumping. Big, uh, you know, pubs had their outdoor areas and so on. It was a full festival. Yeah. So uh, it's good to hear that it's uh, coming back to Wexford. When was the last time it was there? I was in a Scorty in Wexford. So I think I think I was four. I think it was ninety six or ninety seven. Yeah, that was the last time. And that and being honest, that's close. That's close in in years to have a flat because a location mm-hmm. gets it for two years. They get it, yeah, and then they swap it. And then they swap it. So I remember, like, I think. Uh, I, I think Tullamore got it for three years. Cavan got it for three years because they were so successful. Okay. Then it went to Derry for a year, Sligo for two years, Mullingar for two years, Wexford for two years. Uh-huh. So you can see the little route it does. I, I I think the South deserves it big time. Yeah. I, yeah. I think it's, it's been a while. I like, I don't think Claire was good enough for the Kerrys, the Corks and all that. I think it needs to go hard into the South because yeah, because they provide so much funding. They have all the accommodation. They have the best rent. Like Cork in itself is, sorry, I'm sorry to tell you as a dub, but it is a big city, like, you know? Yeah. It yeah. is, it is the almost capital. You know? Yo. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to put it like that. But, uh, ah, man, I love it. It's a, uh, I think it deserves it, but yeah, nothing right. can can be done in schools about this teaching thing. But anyway, yeah, that that was is. literally what I was going to come back to quickly. Uh, just watch the age group of the, the the classes you go into, from the age of three all the way up to the age of nineteen. Okay, all of them, all of them. and you just said there's nothing you can do. Like in your opinion. What can be done, or what's something that can be a first step? Because there's always something that we can do. 
um, or can be done? What do you see in your opinion? Uh, something that can be done that would help bring back the love for or is trad music? Because what I'm sort of hearing from you is there's obviously the generation that's pumping it out there now. Yeah. But when obviously life, the circle of life takes its hold, the next generation is not going to carry it forward. So there's gaps. What's, well, I think the festivals that are deemed at these age groups don't have the inspiration there to pick up an instrument. And that's nothing against the artists because I love them artists, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, it's DJ music. It's MCs. It's garage. It's techno. It's dance. So no one is up on stage inspiring anyone other than a DJ. Now, will they all become DJs? Nah, they're happy enough to be in the crowd. Do you know what I mean? This attitude. Yeah. To help it, put more live bands up on stage. Country could do something. Country's doing something in 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 Ireland now. The two Johnnies and stuff. There, there are young people watching that. But I think it's more of a crack factor more so than a music factor. And that's yeah, the yeah. lads. What they're doing is absolutely brilliant. But <laughs> it's... It's getting live bands back on stages that are deemed at the younger generation. Like I remember my I was doing a, a thing in college on Stevie Wonder, an exam on Stevie Wonder or an essay or a thesis or something. And my father says, Oh, that's mad. I went to see him when I was eighteen back in back in the RDS. And it makes you think my father went to see a stage full of instrumentalists, musicians, mm -hmm. singers. Whereas people who were his age then now are going up the road to see Kygo. Yeah. To press a few buttons and go. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you know? yeah. A few fist pumps. Yeah, fist it's pump. interesting. And do you think that's, um, you know, even with rap music, the quality of musician, if you will, it's not where it used to be. Like you look at Prince, you look at, you know, Stevie Wonder and Michael Jackson. Uh, yeah. and a few others like Dr. Dre, Snoop Dogg, all of them. They're multifaceted in what they can do. But now musicians have a whole team of people that create the music for them. So yeah. do you, what what's your opinion of that? Or oh, just this is just an interesting conversation for me. <laughs> what what with the quality of playing? Yeah, just the quality of yeah, like, the, do you feel music is as good as it used to be? Or musicians as well? Are they skilled and qualified? Yeah, I think I think every era has its legends. It reminds you of someone saying to me, like, oh, no, it wasn't someone saying to me. It was Dick Pierce from uh, Rock, Block and Beats. And he literally just made the point going, think back to the 90s properly. Think of the bands we had, Metallica, Nirvana, Blur. Oasis, Bowie, Stay, and it went on and on, and it's kind of like, oh my god, we yeah. don't, we don't produce legends anymore in this era. But you look at today's world: Beyonce, Adele, Ed Sheeran, they're legends. They they will be icons. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, but... as good as I don't know. I think the skill is still there, but I think the the sounds are. I don't know. I just can't believe the charts sometimes whenever I go through it, like whenever I go down through like like a top 10. Go back down through a top 10 back in 1998 compared to 2024. It'll wreck your head like. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's that's part of the reason for the question. You know, because of those three, Beyonce is of the, like they're all legends. They're absolutely incredible. Um, Beyonce has a massive team behind her. Um, I know she's incredible at what she does. She's done the hard graft back in the day, but now they're littered with fucking director of music and the X, Y, and Z. And like I've seen that in one of the, I don't know whether it was a Grammy, but a few years back, some band was a uh, best performer, a best, best artist, whatever it was, where she had a whole, like probably about 50 people in that category where that helped yeah. her to produce her album. I think, I can't remember what the category was. And then it had this other guy, a bit like Ed Sheeran, that wrote his own lyrics, played his own instruments, fucking produced his own music. You know, 
Yeah. Like a yeah. unicorn of music, you know? Yeah. Um, now, Beyonce was that back in the day. She, I'm sure she still has the skills for it. But a lot of musicians and artists these days don't have that foundation. They just start with no. the electronic music. No, you because, they that have, because they have because they have the money for everything else to be done for them. Mm-hmm. It's kind of it's like they have the money to fund a team to basically AI their next album, uh-huh. but but in an organic way. <laughs> Yeah, it's interesting uh, because uh, what 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 are your thoughts on Taylor Swift? Yeah, she's good. She's a good show woman. She knows how to sell tickets. She's a billionaire. She does very good. She works hard. That's about it, really. I I wouldn't be a massive fan. Uh huh. Um, and I wouldn't say no to it either if I got free tickets. I actually okay. was looking for tickets. I'm very much into the show. And the spectacle of today's music more so than the music. Yeah, like, yeah. I love big, big creations. Like more got me tickets to Imagine Dragons a couple of years ago, and I love them, love their albums and stuff. But sure, all I could think of, but sure, all I could talk about was the lighting show and the <laughs> timing, and then like the timing of like all of the lads walking back on stage and being there and five six seven eight and everyone's back into position and then the runway opens and then all the pyro goes off i love that mm-hmm. so taylor swift obviously i heard it was a good show but right now i'm looking to go to shows like coldplay were you uh, there Pink. no don't go ahead <laughs> <laughs> uh coldplay pink pink is um, i was at coldplay as well by the way Second one, yeah. saying, yeah, Unreal. Pink is incredible. I seen Pink in uh, two thousand eight in in Australia. It might have been two thousand nine. It was only when I got to Australia. It was one of those ones. All the lads are going with the girls, and I was like, you know what, fuck, I'll go. But my God, she's yeah, a performer. She she's is. a performer. Yeah, and did you, you know what? Tying into this whole podcast episode, and from what I saw about from like the start and values and being able to do what you do and do it so well. Her new documentary on Prime, she brings her family everywhere. They live with her on tour. They're in her bed whenever whenever she gets back in from a show because they can't sleep. You know what I mean? Uh-huh. Like so so her home travels with her. Yeah. It's it's unbelievable. She doesn't see the reason of going to work and leaving your family back back at home home. She doesn't see the reasoning behind uh-huh. it. I want to be able to do that at some point in my life to get to a place where I can say, right, Maura, a career break. Because the two of us are going to, we're going to actually operate this brand that's con more, that's going to put on big shows and festivals, okay? We're going to do this. We're going to go to America with Shulin and enjoy two or three weeks. We can do this, but we've just moved into a house of things, you know. So yeah, yeah, we're, yeah. So we are going to look towards that because we're watching Pink going. She's she's so right, like she is right, and she does it because and because she's so successful. And I believe this. She's so successful because her values are correct. Mm-hmm. They are absolutely bang on. The energy that she's putting out there is because her family are waiting for her side stage. Why else wouldn't you be the best performer in the world? Mm, love you know? that. Gold. Absolute gold. Oh, I don't know what her family is like. How many kids does she have? Just a quick one. I think she's two or three. Well, that's the thing, isn't it? Mm. Kids are always looking to see uh, yeah. what, the men- what the parents, the, the guardians, the mentors, uh, it's incredibly inspiring. For them to understand yeah. that they can do that. So we're uh, good on her. She's a fucking yeah. weapon. She's Absolutely. a weapon. Um I had a question for you there. Fear. I didn't want to bring fear back up yet, but it's it's there anyway. So you mentioned fear. You were uh, part of how you operate in, in life is um the undertone or the driving force of all of that is fear. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, so um, 
kind of into my late teens and into my early 20s, um, I underwent some mental health issues and I was failing, basically, as a person, uh, as myself, as a businessman, as a friend, as a boyfriend, as everything. And um, it kind of spiraled all from uh, burning the candle at both ends, teaching classes, doing workshops, being a full time band member up and down to Clondalkin to write songs, to rehearse, to record. Never had enough money, I thought, and wow. had to keep making more, had to keep having sleepless nights. And I got to the stage then when I, whenever I would be on stage with Shalin and I would start feeling an unbelievable, an unbelievable sense of anxiety. I started getting uh-huh. stage fright very late into my career that I never underwent. So the reason why I have a fear of failing is because I know what, I know what the fear feels like. And it's terrible. It's the worst. It's horrific. Um, yeah, you can get some people around you to help you get back out of it. But you have to, you have to put, you have to give yourself the leg up first. Uh-huh. To no. want to do it, like, you know. So uh-huh. throughout college, didn't like college, didn't like living in Dublin. Didn't like, didn't like music for maybe two or three years. Uh-huh. Felt like I was a, a commercial leave your soul at the door, sort of performing monkey. Start looking into other jobs, looked into the post office, looked into working in Foot Locker. This real extreme thinking was going on while running classes with kids, going into school, trying to inspire them. But I, but then I'd get back into my car going, sure, you're not going to keep this up forever. I've just after been lying to a, to a class of 30 kids about doing what you want. Don't listen to everyone else. Get a pen and paper every night. Have a, have like a notepad. What do you need to do? Who do you need to talk to? Get a website going. Do like your graphics yourself. It's more, it's more organic. It's more you. I'm getting back into a car going, oh, I'm so unhappy. Mm -hmm. You know, and then, uh, I kind of put it all down to my wife and, myself for getting myself out of that hole I think it's very important to realize that only you can do it as well as the help of your wife or your friends or whoever got you out of it and that fear knocks on my door most mornings and Mm -hmm. they're net and they're never ever allowed in like Mm because I won't I won't allow it and that's the only way to do it it's only you that can let the fear in. Yeah. You know? Fair play to you. And uh, another thing I would ask is, is there, is there any such thing as failure? No. It's a lesson, isn't it? There you go. The man who fails is the man who gives up. Or the woman who gives up. Yeah. It's very yeah. good. A lesson. What's that phrase again? The man who fails is the man who gives up. Now, I'm going to write that down myself because I just thought of it there. (laughs) I can see it now on Wikipedia in 20 years' time. (laughs) Dara Byrne, 2024. Uh, Instagram memes or whatever you call it. Uh, There you go. So for you, uh, tell us about your your, your quick hero journey through that process because it's obviously... You know, for, sounds fairly heavy. You're wearing a mask, um, and it, that's the thing. What, what a lot of people don't understand is you can't run away from yourself. So the more yeah. we wear these masks on the outside, it kills us a little more on the inside. So the quicker you be honest, you tell me actually, tell me your story. Um, so I, I, um, I began the process of to fix it. Um, uh huh. If you will, um, I started to fix it, um, back in two thousand and fourteen, uh-huh. and I went to psychotherapy, um, I went, I went to psychotherapy and 
how I coped with it socially wasn't great. Mm-hmm. Well, I did all did all of the things that people shouldn't do whenever they're undergoing it. On the um, session. On 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 the session, yeah. Uh-huh. Absolutely. Um I had I had the money to do it because I was a businessman and I didn't have a lot of it, but I had a wage. Mm-hmm. And I had and like I said at the start of this podcast, I had the privilege of giving myself my own oh. holidays. So uh-huh. I could work all through that weekend and then session for the next two weekends, you know, things like that. And yeah, uh, went to psychotherapy, I'd say for the bones of six months, came away from it and got a lot of coping out of it, got a lot of uh, resilience out of it, got a lot of strength from it. Um, And yeah, I, I'm not one to, to kind of to become fairly stationary on something that's going wrong. So, uh, uh-huh. so I try and fix it quite quickly. And that was kind of held ag- against me professionally, as in this doesn't, this isn't something that you can get into your stride overnight. This is something that you, you have to work at. And it's bad. You don't realize you're working at it until you kind of feel like she's not actually all right. And I've been yeah. all right for the last couple of months or there's no day where it's like, ah, all of your tests have come, all of your tests yeah. have come back, Mr. Moore, you're now happy again. Like that, <laughs> like that's not, that's yeah. not, it's like, I love that you know? analogy. So it's kind of, it's, um, it's something that I've definitely grown an awful lot more from, from going through. I don't think I'm the only one. I can guarantee you whoever is listening to this podcast has gone through it. Uh-huh. I think we all have in this in this modern era it's very hard for any Irishman, woman, family to not go through it considering the country that we're living in, the times that we are living in, the rates that are being pressed up against us. Just as a side note, look at the telly last week, 600 restaurants had to close down in in like the year family businesses also family businesses that have been booming with business but it's not enough it wow. doesn't matter do you know what i mean inflation so, inflation so i can mm. guarantee it there's a lot of those 600 owners that are lying in a bed somewhere right now going mm-hmm. fuck this and you know thank you very much for bringing that up by the way um no problem what would you say to people who are listening to this podcast and might be going through that exact thing? You can't do it. You can't do it yourself. You have mm-hmm. to, you have to you have to speak to a professional. It's all well and good getting a few pints into you and going, I'm not feeling the best now. And I'm on medication. Well, you can't be on medication. You know, if you're mm-hmm. gonna burn the candle at both ends and go drinking. You know, you you just can't speak to someone professional. I even got such, I I got so much from that time that I actually went back to psychotherapy last year, but not for depression or mental health issues, kind of like a life coaching thing. Uh I'm going through X, Y, and Z professionally. I want to make sure that my emotions are intact before I go attacking these things. How can you help me? And yeah. she said, the first thing she said was, oh, thank God you won't be crying. Right. Perfect. You know what I, mean? <laughs> oh, so man. I actually was in there to see how I was to approach my next move. You know, yeah. granted, I had a few. I've had um, I've had a bit of turbulence in the last two years with with the industry, yeah, with business associates and things like that. And I kind of thought, all right, I, I, I need to start cleaning them out, get rid uh-huh. of the dead wood. You know, I don't stick around and go, oh, will I, won't I? Like my circle now in this in this industry is so small. Uh-huh. And that's for a reason, you know? And yeah. it's not because I don't like or don't want to work, but... Keep your circle of trust really, really small in every walks of life. If 
uh-huh. if you're going through um, a business deal, if you're going through mental health, if you're going through something you want to keep private, you know, keep your circle really, really small uh-huh. because the smaller the circle, the, mm-hmm. the, the stronger it actually is. Okay, beautiful. Thank you for that. Um, three quick questions to finish up. Um, yeah. I have a client immediately after this. So uh, quickly, what's next for Connor Moore and where can people find you? Um, my next big one uh, will be on my Instagram either today or tomorrow. I am supporting a very big Irish act in a couple of weeks. Um, I'm not well, quite you, ahead. You, sorry to cut across you, but you can You're say right. their name because it's going to be a couple of weeks before this goes live. Grand. Well, I could have played with them already, but I will be supporting Mark McCabe and Mimi Lane in the Spiegel tent in Wexford. Um, special because it's the Spiegel tent. It's like an old Belgian circus tent. And what, it's a what? Is that a festival? Yeah, it's, it's a festival I'll, that runs. I'll have to tell all my mates. Spiegel. Spiegel tent. Yeah. Um, and I'll be playing with Mark and Mimi. Um, that's really cool. That's kind of the next big thing. Um, I will be doing the 10th anniversary uh, of 12 Pubs of Drums in the next two years. But I'm thinking about kicking the whole 10-year anniversary and just taking a run and jump at it this year. Uh-huh. Um, so that's been it's going to be 10 years on since the last one has been done. And myself and Daddy Sax and Casa Disco are just going to keep grooving on dance floors. And you can okay. find me on it. In- on Instagram at Conmore underscore drums, or you can look into me further at soundoutrhythm.ie. Legend, absolute legend. Um, for anybody who has kids who want to get into drums or bad music, this is your man. It's been a pleasure, an absolute pleasure to uh, chat to somebody with such a depth of wisdom at such a young age. Um, yeah, thank you for your time today. Final Thanks, question. Sarah. Final hmm. question. Um, what does success mean to you? How well you cope with the situation. <laughs> um, success, being happy, being comfortable and time, having lots of time to y- yourself. That's that's the success. Because if you have if you have those moments to like yourself and your and your family and like we went off to the zoo yesterday of a Monday, mm-hmm. you know, with the little one. And it was like 24 degrees, like Bali stuff, you know, oh, it was lovely. deadly. And deadly. We, we could do that because, because we work hard. Uh-huh. And that to me is success. It's not about banking the big checks. It's about getting yourself enough to tie yourself over, to get your dream house, to have, to have your dream life. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Love it. Connor, again, thank you very much for your time. Um, thank you, Darren. Enjoy the rest of your day. All right, buddy. It's been a pleasure to chat. I can't wait to watch the rest of your story unfold. I'll, I'll be on one of your dance, dance floors soon. Don't worry about that. Please, God, man. Thank you. All right. Good luck. Chat soon. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.